Okay, now we are looking at James chapter 1, verses 9 through 17. And we're going to look at some more facts about the tribulation time period. We're first going to see that the rich in the tribulation are all evil men. And James 1, 9 says, Let the brother of low degree rejoice in that he is exalted. The brother of low degree will be exalted in the millennial kingdom. But James 1.10 says, But the rich, and that he is made low, because as the flower of the grass, he shall pass away. The rich in the book of James are painted in such a negative light because to be rich in the tribulation you have to take the mark. Revelation 13.17, as we quoted in the last lesson, says, And that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark, or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. The people of low degree, the poor people, will be the ones who refuse the mark of the beast, so it will be easier to tell who is really your fellow believers in the tribulation than it is now in the church age. If you see a rich man or someone is at least able to buy groceries and have a home, then you will know he took the mark. The poor and rich people in the time of Jacob's trouble are portrayed by the rich man and Lazarus. In Luke 16.25 it says, But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thou thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. In the church age a man can be rich and still be right with God. And that is another difference between this time we are in now and the time of Jacob's trouble. And that is also another proof the book of James is being directed towards that future time period. And James 1.11 says, For the sun is no sooner risen with a burning heat, but it withereth the grass, and the flower thereof falleth, and the grass, and the grace of the fashion of it perisheth. So also shall the rich man fade away in his ways. Notice in the beginning of the verse the word sun. And when the Son of God comes back at the second advent, all of the rich men will be killed and cast into hell fire. The rich men will fade in his ways. I know you probably think I'm stretching things here, and if you do, then look at Malachi 4.1 and remember the words Son, S-U-N, and Son, S-O-N. Malachi 4.1 says, For behold, the day cometh that shall burn as an oven, and all the proud, yea, and all that do wickedly shall be stubble. And the day that cometh shall burn them up, saith the Lord of hosts, that it shall leave them neither root nor branch. But unto you that fear my name shall the Son of Righteousness, that would be Jesus Christ, arise with healing in his wings, and ye shall go forth and grow up as calves of the stall. And ye shall tread down the wicked, for they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet in the day that I shall do this, said the Lord of hosts. So look at James 1.11 again. It says, For the sun is no sooner risen with a burning heat, but it withereth the grass, and the flower thereof falleth. But the grace of the fashion of it perisheth, so also shall the rich man fade in his ways. And that's obviously referring to the same thing Malachi 4, 1 through 3 is referring to. The Son, S-U-N, is the Son, S-O-N, Jesus Christ. And all of these rich men that are going to be trying to hide in their underground tunnels and bunkers will fear the Lord Jesus Christ and they'll die in their sins. And even right now, as we speak, they're building luxurious underground bunkers for rich people to stay in during a time of emergency. But they're forgetting they can't hide from God. Revelation 6.15 says, And the kings of the earth, and the great men, and the rich men, and the chief captains, and the mighty men, and every bondman, and every free, free man, hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains. The Bible is amazing how it tells the future and everything is turning out just like the Bible said it would turn out. Proverbs 23 1 says, or describes how the wicked rulers and the Antichrist will be in the tribulation time period. 
Proverbs 23, 1 through 8 says, When thou sittest to eat with a ruler, consider diligently what is before thee, and put a knife to thy throat, if thou be a man given to appetite. Be not desirous of his dainties, for they are deceitful meat. Labor not to be rich. Seize from thine own wisdom. Wilt thou set thine eyes upon that which is not? For riches certainly make themselves wings. They fly away as an eagle toward heaven. Eat thou not the bread of him that hath an evil eye. Neither desire thou his dainty meats. For as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. Eat and drink, saith he to thee, but his heart is not with thee. The morsel which thou hast eaten shall thou vomit up and lose thy sweet words. Notice it said, labor not to be rich. The tribulation saint shouldn't want to get riches. He knows what will happen to him if he does. If he asks for wisdom, he will soon realize that riches make themselves wings and fly away as an eagle toward heaven. Notice Proverbs 23, 6 says, Eat thou not the bread of him that hath an evil eye. Remember the Antichrist has a bad right eye, as it says in Zechariah eleven seventeen. A tribulation saint shouldn't give in and take his mark so that they can buy his food in the stores. But he will say, Eat and drink, as it says in verse 7. The tribulation will be as it was in the days of Noah. They will eat and drink and be merry. And what a positive message. And that is because the Antichrist comes in peaceably. And his outlines will resemble something like Joel Osteen's outlines at first. And notice it says in his and notice it says his heart is not with thee. He will seem to be on your side, but he will soon devour you if you let him. All rich people during the time of Jacob's trouble will be under complete control of the Antichrist, and he will lead them to hell. But on to the next point, many tribulation saints will die as martyrs for enduring temptation. And we talked about a temptation a lot in the first lesson of James. But James 1.12 says, Blessed is the man that endureth temptation. For when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. Revelation 2.10 says, Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that ye may be tried, and ye shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. These saints will have to endure unto the end to be saved, like Jesus says in Matthew twenty four thirteen, or they die as a martyr first. When they die as a martyr, that gets them a crown of life. They will be beheaded for not taking the mark of the beast. Beheading someone isn't outdated because many God-hating people are doing this to people right now who don't believe in their false god. So the Bible isn't an outdated book. It is a thousand times more current than any newspaper or talk show or news network. And you are better off reading it than you are any magazine. And you can apply James 1.12 to a church age saint. And that if we endure temptation, we will get a crown of life at the judgment seat of Christ. And there are other crowns people can earn. Other crowns we can get is a incorruptible crown as it talks about in 1 Corinthians 9 25 you read about a crown of glory in 1 Peter 5 4 a crown of righteousness in 2 Timothy 4 8 and a crown of rejoicing in 1 Thessalonians 2 19 so if these tribulation saints are going to get a crown it can't be at the judgment seat of Christ because this judgment seat of Christ is happening while they are on earth during the tribulation Contrary to popular belief, there are saved people at the great white throne judgment. This is where tribulation saints, millennial saints, and Old Testament saints will be judged, along with the lost from all ages and the angels which sinned. Look at Revelation 20.15. This is referring to the great white throne judgment. It says, And whosoever was not found written in the book of life 
was cast into the lake of fire. If there aren't safe people at this judgment, then what would be the point of having the book of life even open? Don't let these commentaries deceive you into thinking it is only lost people at the great white throne judgment. There definitely isn't any church age saints being judged, but what about the other saints? Now look at Revelation 11.18. You will see rewards given out at the great white throne judgment, and the lost don't get rewarded. This proves there will be righteous men at this judgment as well. It says, And the nations were angry, and thy wrath is come, and the time of the dead that they should be judged and that thou shouldest give rewards unto thy servants the prophets, and to the saints, and to them, and them that fear thy name, small and great, and shouldest destroy them which destroy the earth. So there are saved, judged with lost at the great white throne judgment. And James 1.13 says, Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. God won't put the lust in you to produce a temptation, but he will allow you to be tempted. He will allow the devil to tempt you, just like the devil was allowed to tempt Jesus Christ in the garden. Just like Jesus Christ was tempted on an empty stomach, the same goes for a person in the tribulation. They will prob probably be many times the devil will tempt them to take the mark just so they can eat. And he will do this while they are going on an empty stomach. Satan told Jesus Christ to turn the stones into bread. So God allows you to be tempted and sometimes God and the devil work together. Like in the case of Job, God allowed the devil to do those things and Job pictures a Jew in the tribulation. So a tribulation saint is going to have to endure to the end. He is going to want to go by 1 Timothy 5.8 that says, But if any provide not for his own, and especially for those of his own house, he hath denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. But it will, will be hard to follow this verse in the tribulation time period without taking the mark because he won't be able to buy or sell. So what a great temptation this will be. And James 1.14 says, But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. These verses show the process of sin. The devil or devils will present a sinful thing to someone, or tempt them, and if that person starts to entertain that thought, and debates on whether or not to do the act. This is lust, and then he gives in and commits the sin. Then comes death. You remember the order by calling it LSD, lust, sin, and death. So it isn't the temptation that is a sin. Jesus was tempted, but he never sinned. He never entertained the thought of doing the thing. He fought off Satan with the words of God. When we are tempted... We should quote scripture to fight the temptation. And this is the process of how sin enters. First you have the presentation. You are presented with the temptation. Then you have illumination. You have a knowledge of good or evil. Then you debate. You think about whether or not you're going to do it. And that's where sin enters. Then you have the decision. You purpose in your heart to do it. And then you have the action when you follow through with those thoughts. And James 1.16 says, Do not err, my beloved brethren. If you err, then you are wandering away from the right way. You are being drawn away by a temptation. You are debating about doing the sin. You are entertaining that sin in your head. To err is to sin. And Jesus said in Matthew 22.29, Jesus answered and said unto them, Ye do err, not knowing the scriptures, nor the power of God. You err when you don't know the scriptures. It is sin not to know the Bible, or not to be in an attempt to get to know the Bible. People have 24-7 access to God's book in these days we are living in, and in this country especially, and they refuse to pick it up and read the book. 
But like I said, there will be a famine in the land of hearing the words of God in the tribulation time period. But on to the next point. The sign gifts come back in the tribulation. You will see those apostolic signs coming back. James 1.17 says, Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. Notice it says every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, but not every gift, because there are some bad gifts. Do you think when a parent buys an iPhone or an iPad for their teenage son or daughter, so that they can get on Instagram and have instant access to pornographic images, that that would be a good gift? When someone gives you things that will keep you from God, is that a good gift? So every good gift and perfect gift is from above, but not every gift. Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Jesus Christ is a perfect free gift to us. And also God gave out gifts of the Spirit. 1 Corinthians 12, 28 through 31 says, And God hath set some in the church, first apostles, secondarily prophets, thirdly teachers, after that miracles and gifts of healings, helps, governments, diversities of tongues, are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, are all workers of miracles, have all the gifts of healing, do all speak with tongues, do all interpret, but covet earnestly the best gifts, and yet, show I unto you a more excellent way. Many of these gifts have seized, like speaking in tongues and healing have seized. Paul couldn't even heal himself later on in his ministry, and he left Trophimus at Miletum sick. But many of these gifts will return during the time of Jacob's trouble because it goes back to God dealing with the Jews. When the Jews was rejecting Jesus Christ all the way through the book of Acts, Paul says, I'm turning to the Gentiles. So when it switched from Jew to Gentile, the sign gifts ceased. But since in the tribulation the body of Christ is leaving, it's going back from dealing with, it's going from dealing with the Gentiles back to dealing with the Jews. And the Jews require a sign. And th those are sign gifts. And Mark 16, 15 says, And he said unto them, Go ye out into all the world, and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils, and they shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. So then after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven, and sat on the right hand of God. And they went forth and preached everywhere the Lord working with them, and confirming the word with signs following. Notice it says, and confirming the word with signs following. And 1 Corinthians one twenty two says, For the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. And so these sign gifts come back in the tribulation, and tribulation saints can have these apostolic sign gifts. And tribulation saints will taste of the heavenly gift. Hebrews 6, 4 says, For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened, and have tasted of the heavenly gift, and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost, and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come, if they shall fall away, to renew them again into repentance, seeing they crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh, and put him to an open shame. They can lose their salvation in the time of Jacob's trouble. That's what Hebrews 6, 4 through 6 is talking about. Unlike in the church age where we can't lose it, many will wrongly divide and apply Hebrews 6, 4 through 6 to a church age believer, but that contradicts Paul's writings that says we cannot lose our salvation. So if a tribulation saint endures to the end, he will be a partaker of Jesus Christ, but if he draws back into perdition, he burns in hell for eternity. And on to our last point, 
tribulation saints who endure unto the end will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom. James 1.17 says again, Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. God is the Father of lights. He is the opposite of darkness. Jesus Christ is the light. John 1.9 says, That was the true light, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. Genesis 1.16 says, And God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day, and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. The greater light to rule the day will be fulfilled when the real sun shows up. The church age is the night time, but light comes in the morning. And Matthew 13.43 says, Then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their Father. Who hath ears to hear, let him hear. This would be the millennial kingdom. And this is where the greater light shall rule the day. And the children of light shall rule with him. Romans 13.12 says, The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness, and let us put on the armor of light. So right now it is night time. And remember I said Job is a picture of a Jew going through the tribulation. Job 3.2-6 says, And Job spake and said, Let the day perish wherein I was born, and the night in which it was said there is a man child conceived. Let that day be darkness, let not God re regard it from above, neither let the light shine upon it, let darkness and the shadow of death stain it, let a cloud dwell upon it, let the blackness of the day terrify it, as for that night, let darkness seize upon it, let it not be joined into the days of the year, let it not come into the number of the months, he set down right in the middle of the tribulation. He is a picture of the Jews going through the last three and a half years of the tribulation, which is also nighttime. Notice how much those verses have the words night and darkness. So he sit down right in the middle of the tribulation before the real sun rises with a burning heat at the second advent, which James 1.11 was referring to. Let's, re let's read James 1.11 again, it says, For the sun is no sooner risen with a burning heat, but it withereth the grass, and the flower thereof falleth, and the grace of the fashion of it perisheth. So also shall the rich man fade in his ways. And James 1.17, again, Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, and cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. And the variableness in verse 17 is susceptibility to change. And you know God doesn't change. So this has been James chapter 1, verses 9 through 17. And we will finish the rest of the chapter next time.